I don't relate to a lot of characters. A lot of characters relate to me, it's me insane. <laughs> you know, in an unplanned fashion, this feels like a trilogy. Not quite sure what I'll call this, but I like how all these three videos relate to one another. So, this video was honestly inspired by a conversation I had with my good friend Koba, and it started with this tweet. After a few messages back and forth, we had a very long conversation about what it means to relate to a character, how we relate to them, why we relate to them, and the constitutions behind making a character relatable. During the conversation, there was something that was said that put some of my thoughts on the matter into perspective. The thing about a character is to not make them relatable to everyone, but relatable to a few people. This is something very reminiscent of Spider-Man's don't think about saving everyone, think about saving one person line because of the layers of depth to it. So, when Koba said that, it really directed the framework of how I wanted to construct the thesis of my argument. When it comes down to writing characters, it's a very divisive conversation behind what makes a character a good character. The same way we may ask what makes a character relatable. Is it based on the connection we are able to have with them? The similarities we are able to draw between ourselves and them? If we were to place that character from that fictional world into our real world? While we can debate the qualities of what makes a character relatable, I have a different stance I'd like to make entirely which further expands on the previous point made by Koba in regards to making these characters subscribe to a universal archetype. Which is this, more often than not you may perhaps relate to the experience a character goes through as opposed to the character itself and either conflict it to or reverse it to. I think this is a very important distinction to make, that between personality and experience as it really adds a new layer of analyzing a character, the quality of that character both within and extrinsically analyzed from the world they're in, and honestly yourself and what you see yourself to be reflected in these fictional bodies. Often, writers will take the approach of cutting corners when constructing a character by making them overly generic. So that everyone can understand them, but cannot see themselves in them, which is something I view to be another confusing distinction. Understanding someone doesn't automatically mean you can see yourself in them, neither does it mean you're able to relate to them. In a way, this is a variation of picking certain particulars and characters to use as pragmatic functions for our day to day living on your day to day speak that we either consciously or subconsciously do with more evil, villainous, or morally ambiguous characters. Therefore, I would like to pose a question which will be deconstructing throughout the duration of this video to better understand the dichotomy between relating to experiences and characters, and that question is this, what makes a character relatable? Now, knowing the heavy subjective nature of this topic, you could ask 10 different people what makes a character relatable and get 10 different answers. However, the common consensus seems to be how much one is able to humanize a character. Humanize them in ways in which we can see them commit actions that we ourselves would do or at least rationalize. As mentioned in the tweet by Koba, writers will often perceive writing characters as some form of universals for the purpose of ensuring that understood for everyone would in turn reduce that personal effect to have with that character. In this light, many details that can be further developed in order to establish a much more complex construction of a character's personality. One of the responses I had to this would be that this may imply that if a character were to lack these complex or unique personalities, would we be unable to relate to them? While we can't understand them, similarly to how white people can understand systematic racism, they cannot relate to a person of color who has experienced systematic racism. In this case, relating to a character or personality would have to mean, obviously, that there would be some type of experience that would be parallel to our way of living. Of course, you could argue as to what would count as a complex or unique personality, which, for this video, complex and unique would be the amount of introspection we would see in this character on a psychological level without it being contrived, distorted from the narrative, and works within the framework of the fictional world and the author has created. To back up my point, George R. R. Martin, the writer of A Song of Ice and Fire, when asked about who was the hardest character to write, he revealed it was Bran. Uh, the most difficult viewpoint character to write is Bran, and he has always been the hardest. He is the youngest viewpoint character, which, uh, you know, is difficult in and of itself, because when you're writing a character that young, you can't simply write what's going on. You have to filter everything through, okay, he's eight years old, what does he understand? He's, he's seeing this scene, does he actually understand what's, what's happening in this scene? Like when he comes on Jamie and Cersei, well, they don't have any clothes on and they're wrestling, you know, because uh, an eight-year-old has a different way of perceiving these things. Uh, his language has to be carefully considered. What words does he know? How would, how would an eight-year-old phrase this sentence or a nine-year-old? Ten, obviously, he grows during the course of the story. I think this answer gives us much insight into the authenticity of Bran's character, how the other characters within this world exist, and how to effectively write a character that, even if we are not similar to, 
can understand and even relate with. Bran, when the story first begins, is a young child. His scope of the world and what inhabits it are very limited in comparison to other characters of the series. Therefore, how do you, as an older man, write a child in a world full of grit and darkness? How do you make a child live as a child among adults in a way which is organic to the story? As Martin said, you have to filter through everything that's going on. What does he understand and how can I make the reader understand what he's interpreting? So he has to write him in a way in which an age world would describe what two adults caught in the act would be doing, for example. The words used and expressions required to help translate information that was learnt. When this happens, we're able to grasp not only just the world Martin has created, but the world he has created for Bran. A world which is interpreted by Bran. The necessity to filter out Bran's expressions as an authentic child helps ground the character in the struggles that he faces, how he interacts with other characters, and the overall setting. It also makes the contrast to more characters relative to his age, such as Aya and Joffrey, a lot more vicious. With Joffrey in personality and Aya in her coldness and calculations to succeed as a killer. With these three characters and their varied personalities, you are able to gauge a complex assessment of how Martin is able to write distinct personalities with different outlooks on their world due to their individual journeys given their age. I know this was a very painful death, but... It didn't look painful enough, if y'all know what I mean. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like he deserved to die more. However, if we were to take the death of Ned Stark and the effects that it had on Bran, Aya, and we can see the shifts in the development, to us, as the reader, we may not be able to relate to these characters simply because they reach just beyond our scope, but we cannot discredit them because they do not exist in generics or universal fashions. Seeing their changes in development, nature, their interactions, and how they evolve both as an individual and sociologically is what grounds and greater establishes them. On the other side, another example would be someone like Kratos from the God of War franchise. Hello. From the first God of War to God of War Ragnarok, we see the intricacies of this vengeful man whose personality and character revolved around destruction, chaos, and vengeance turn into a more understanding, calm, and tempered man who seeks to reconcile with himself and his past as he confronts who he is, what he has done, and what he now aspires to be. He is a character who is admittedly hard to relate to, even when it comes to trying to relate to his experiences. Understandably, for you mortals, unlike myself, it is something you surely cannot fathom. However, with such a niche area of any distinct relation to an experience, it greatly enhances the emotional connection we have to him without having to relate to him, without projecting our own feelings. With that in mind, the organic merit of Kratos, organic merit meaning the feelings we do not need to impart onto him, make it so that Kratos' qualities are a lot more intrinsic both to him, the world, and the story he is a part of. I would classify this as a unique and complex character without the use of having us, the viewer, install any of our own modes of personality onto them simply because of how rich and intricate the writing of the character is. That's not to say we cannot do so or the character's qualities would be reduced if we place ourselves in them, but merely they are substantiated enough to where we can see the character for what it is and who they are without feeling like they need to represent something to us or for us. Other characters I would say that fall into this category would be Arthur Morgan from Red Dead Redemption 2, Sasashi Kojiro from Vagabond, Woody from Toy Story, Doctor Doom when he's enforced to cry about national tragedy despite being a character bent on world domination and has done far worse. Oppositely, where we have the characters that do not need the projection, you have those in which we project ourselves into them which amplify their merit and therefore character. I'd argue for some characters it's adding something where something doesn't exist, and in that aspect it can create an artificial or even superficial layer of depth. Here, relatability can be used to bridge the gaps in lieu of a lackness in quality and uniqueness or complexity. Even if they don't truly represent these personable qualities, we like to think they do simply because they adhere to us in the most generic form like Goku. Now, before you dorks start donning y'all white hoods and demanding me to come outside, GET OUT HERE I gotta go. There are two ways I look at Goku in particular. I look at him as what he represents in the story of Dragon Ball, and then I look at him as a character outside of Dragon Ball. I don't think he's a good or complex character in either, at least after the Cell Saga. I cannot factor in what I think about him in Super because besides the Tournament 6 arc and the Broly movie, I don't watch Dragon Ball. It's nostalgia bait for me. Goku, to many, represents hard work, tenacity, strength, and good genuine intentions. But this is something you can find in almost any superhero or hero anywhere. 
I'm not going to argue whether or not these are relatable qualities because they are, but I will say that he is someone who is a catalyst or projection to better his character, similar to the critique I had about Jujutsu Kaisen, and this is to create a tether to which the comparison made between yourself and the characters you love to connect to a stronger degree. In contrast to Goku, I view Superman and many who see to be very similar to Goku and even more generic as a far more complex character. Despite the many depictions and iterations of Superman, one of the driving constants is that he is essentially a god who forces himself to live as a man, as a human. He will abide by state laws and policies, uphold the legal and justice system and follow strict moral and ethical codes. Because of this, he limits how strong he is to exponential degrees, opting to use his full strength only when he has to. These very restrictions are what I find intriguing and almost very meta about Superman's character. He knows we cannot relate to him, so he wishes to relate to us. Clark Kent isn't the persona the same way Superman isn't the persona. I view them both as two different people that share the same body, and I view Clark Kent to be the character, the person, Superman, on occasion, wishes he was. Not to reject his own birthright or who he is, but for reasons that simply relate to those that have allowed him to call Earth home without having to bear the weight of the responsibility that comes with it. As I call back to this one panel that I really like with Superman, when trapped in the Phantom Zone with Rogue Ozar, when thinking about why he is where he is and how he got there, he contemplates as to why he doesn't just destroy everything knowing that he can, but his visions of Martha and John come to calm him down. Moments like this are what truly humanize Superman so that we can relate to him, so that he can create experiences for us to relate to, and it's the exact same thing with someone like Spider-Man, which explains why we like characters like them so much. With an idea of complex characters and what makes them relatable now established, we can now understand what I mean by that statement I made at the beginning, which is to where you relate to experiences and not characters. More often than not, many of these characters exist in an abstraction, different from our reality, so who they are and what they go through can be difficult to level with. To shortcut this, we will look at a moment in their lives, an action in which they do, and draw a comparison from there. Peter Parker's experience of struggling in New York to pay rent and work in a job which doesn't pay much, many would associate to their own lives. That experience is something many would find a relation in, and therefore, would relate to Peter Parker. However, the ramifications as to why Peter can't pay his bills and work that particular job is very important because, in truth, he's broke by choice, whereas you're not. It's a very subjective mode of relatability as opposed to a one-to-one -one type of relatability. As well there are generics, these generics fit in with the character overall, the code, and the makeup of who Spider-Man is. The desire to do this, however, is, once again, Create it so you can construct that tether so you have some type of closeness to the agent you desire to see as a fictional counterpart to you. With streamlines as to how these specific experiences are not characteristics, but they can build characteristics. This isn't to say you need to go through similar events to relate to someone's characteristics, but the events which create these characteristics are as important as the traits themselves. We love Killua's change from the cold merciless assassin into a much more compassionate hunter because of the lifestyle he had as a Zodic and as a prize winner that too. Therefore, simply saying Kilowa and I are the same because we're both cold and calculated individuals is a misinterpretation of understanding why you relate to Kilowa. The last of these characters are particular, unique, and very specific. This is why not only Kilowa, but almost the entire cast of Hunter x Hunter is amazing. Gon is, even when compared to other characters, insane. His morality isn't shaped by any societal imposed goodness, it's strictly dictated by him, his feelings, and what's relevant to him. Those that are an enemy to his friends are an enemy to him. But one of the most interesting things about Gon is how he judges others relative to his life, the moral relativism. With Nobunaga, he cannot fathom the idea that the Phantom Troop can kill without empathy, but be capable of feeling sadness at the death of Ulogan. As a reader, we understand the life they went through in Media City, and what the Phantom Troop witnessed, but Gon is foreign to that past. But this isn't the same with Kilwa. He instantly connected with him, and soon after knowing who he is, he still denied Kilwa being a bad person because he is good to him and wants to be his friend. These are the very things we can understand. Those in war or politics fight for the side they believe in, and the number of lives destroyed in their opposition is validated by the cause they perceive to be in the advocacy of the greatest good. We don't believe that our enemies have empathy because if they did, why would they do what they do? Why would they destroy? In this case, we turn empathy into a categorical objective concept, one strict on conditions that must be followed. Gon cannot understand the great area of morality. He largely sees it from his own perspective, as it is the only one, primarily, that matters. For a 12-year-old, despite the heavy mature themes of the shows, we are able to see how this could be the case in our own reality. But it's rare to see people compare themselves or look to relate to Gon. Of course, there is someone's gravitational factor that also comes into play. As a wise man once said, 
We don't try to adopt the personalities of losers, do we? Not to say that Gon is a loser, but given his childlike passivity and often misunderstood character, with the addition that he's a child, we do not look to project his experiences through us and us through him. We'd rather take someone like Krollo and say, I relate to him. Again, the reasons why they construct Krollo into why he is what he is isn't really that comparable, so you'll pick a person and character traits that are the most compatible with yours and look to create a match, like how he has a nihilistic outlook on life and a very morbid acceptance of reality, and his struggling with understanding his identity comes from his past and living in Media City, compared to yours because you read a page from Schopenhauer and now you think you're the next philosophical realist. But then again, while I would previously claim a desire to be edgy and superficially mysterious and misunderstood, I've also come to realize the degree in which someone relates to someone or something isn't something that can be objectively measured or quantified. But one would have to acknowledge you have contorted this relatability a little bit to a certain degree so that it fits your desire to have this character as your avatar. This goes into understanding how our personal experiences then intersect with these artificial experiences. Since we as individuals can evaluate our experiences from its most personal level, it isn't advocated to debate or question someone's experience on something and then question their relation to something else. Which may pose a question. If that experience is one which molds that character, making that person who they are when presented, and if I can relate to that experience, then, by relation, is that not me being able to relate to the character? An angle I can understand, but one I would counter by saying it's more of someone saying, I can relate to that, or I can relate to what you've been through, as opposed to saying, I can relate to you, as the decisions made that alter that character are different from yours. Relating to an emotional state formed from an event are filled with different qualities, which make the differences an important factor to this tether. As with the Corolla example, you are able to relate to what he feels, but not why he feels that way. We are able to see the conditions that shaped and morphed his way of thinking. We understand that and can even conceptualize how similar things can happen in our reality. But even in this extreme case, this is not something you can relate to. I want to end off with the idea of projecting your own worlds and feelings into characters isn't something that should be disregarded. We hold sentimental value in objects given to us or that we find because we ascribe a memory to it in some form of emotion. It's what strengthens the power of that object's value. If it's for the purpose of wanting to feel some type of closeness, connection, hell, to, for once, even feel like something understands you in this world is so misunderstood, that is something we can all relate to, I feel. There are even at times where I will look up and fall victim to apophenia, because in truth, sometimes I project myself in a cloud. Detached and unbothered from the earth, not grounded and bound by laws others have created for me then expect to follow, to live without degree or code to anyone but nature itself yet be sort of one with the weightlessness of it all, I simply move in a direction fitting for who I am. Sure, I may not have a sense of direction or have a desire to morph and assimilate, but I feel at peace and being unreachable, isolated, but always seen and looked upon as a beauty or even as a crisis. I am one with nature and nature is one with me. I see myself in a cloud because that's how I feel, connected to the heavens but one with the earth. That way, I suppose, if you're to relate to anything, fictional or not, inanimate or with motion, it's always good to relate to the things that you're able to project peace and tranquility into. <laughs> nah. nah! No, fuck, there's no hell. Trying, no okay, trying to relate to good guys. Boy, get the fuck out of my face with this bullshit. Dog. Maybe I'll shut the fuck up and blow this bitch up. I ain't never gave up one time. In the land of the lost, I've been in the law. If you ever try to stop me, then you won't be scared. <laughs> You know what's crazy? I already recorded this epilogue, but then my mic was turned off. I hate life. Anyway, imagine putting 20,000 people in a room, one room, 20,000 people on this earth in one room, and they all look onto the stage and say, I know who that person is, and I rate that person, I mess with them. That's what just happened when I reached 20,000 subscribers. Like, thank y'all for that. That's kind of crazy still. Like, I'm gonna keep it a buck. Um, I'm enjoying the fact that I'm able to make videos of things that have been in my head for many years now. All things that come to my head spontaneously and create discussion pieces about it. So I know some of my videos can relate to some of y'all and it projects thoughts that other people don't know how to project. So thank y'all for this type of niche community. 
that's being formulated right now. We're a, we're a cool, tight knit group of crazy youngins or old people. I don't discriminate. Uh, now for the Redux reference, because the Redux reference, you gotta drop it in this video, not the next one, because the next one is gonna be a sequel to another video. I'm pretty sure y'all can guess what that is, but I need to keep I need to keep that one kind of contained and relevant. So keep the Redux reference on this video, and that one is uh, what is a character that you guys relate to, a relatable character to you. You know what I mean? I know who y'all think my character is. Y'all think it's Isaac, and I'm not gonna confirm or deny that, but I won't say who mine is because I don't really have one. I'm gonna be so real with you. I don't really find much relation to like a lot of characters. Um, I did when I was younger, but I don't know. I just relate to me. I am me, and I relate to me. <laughs> that's also an applicable. That's also an applicable answer, by the way. If you just say yourself, then that's that's right. Anyway, uh, I'm rambling now, as per usual. So, thank y'all for enjoying the video. Thank y'all for 20,000 subs. Y'all crazy. I love y'all. And yeah, I'm gonna see y'all next time. Back to the shoutouts I go.